So welcome everyone. My name is Sarah. I am a program coordinator for Virginia Clean Cities and I will be your host and moderator today for our electric vehicles, heavy duty vehicle and vehicle to grid technology workshop. Um, just a heads up to everyone, we will be recording this and it will be shared after the event. Um, so just so everyone knows, uh, we have a, a number of great speakers today for this event. Um, moving over to our agenda, we will be learning about electric vehicles and current funding opportunities, the charging spectrum, heavy to duty electric vehicles, and vehicle to grid technologies. Um, up first, we will hear from Virginia Clean City's own Alan Harnett about funding opportunities and electric vehicles. Alan, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, first, I want to start off and thank Sarah for uh, hosting this and the Virginia Clean Cities team for getting out the word about this. I want to thank the participants in this webinar. Uh, thank you guys for your time today. I wanted to talk a little bit. Uh, I also want to thank all the speakers. I wanted to talk a little bit about a few funding opportunities. Um, the purpose of this is just to try to break the ice. There's so much to do with electrification um, or with alternative fuels. It's good to know that there's some help. Um, Virginia Clean Cities would love to help you write grants and to help you achieve some transition here. And there's support because these, these are early technologies. You know, sometimes when you're on the cutting edge, you need to be sure to be collaborating um, and, and be supported. And so I just want to list a few funding opportunities. Right now, the EPA has an open opportunity looking for diesel engine replacements uh, or repowers. And the DERA Act, the Diesel Emission Reduction Act, provides, usually it's about 25% funding for vehicles. It is 45% funding for uh, electric and alternative fuel vehicles. It's a 60% funding if it's a motor conversion to electric. This funding is open right now. It's $46 million nationwide, which is much more than it's ever been. And so there should be some great opportunities for scrappage and replacement of uh, uh, traditional diesel vehicles to electric vehicles. And so just, if you're looking at a heavy duty replacement, now's the time to be planning and budgeting for it. Also the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality plans to roll out a school bus incentive program, which would be $20 million this year, including maybe two rounds, but it would provide up to $265,000 per school bus. So I certainly wanna encourage people to keep an eye out for that program if it's a school bus fleet that you're operating. And then if it's a transit fleet, there's a couple of programs that provide a lot of funding Right now, there's also $180 million available nationwide for the low and no emissions grant program. The low no program offers 85% funding of the vehicles and infrastructure. And you could pair that with some of the funding you'll hear about from some of the utilities today to really get things rolling. Next slide. There's also some evergreen funding opportunities. Alternative fuels are now included in the Virginia DRPT merit program with up to 96% funding. It does require a vehicle to be scrapped, but I would encourage folks to take a look at that. It's already funded about $15 million with of electric school buses, and that's the DRPT merit program. Um, CMAC may provide some funding for conversions, and there may be some opportunities to work with your local planning district on those funds or to contact Virginia Clean Cities for information about any of these. DOT, the Department of Transportation at the federal level has build and tiger programs um, that are infrastructure programs that help pay for all sorts of exciting projects, including electric vehicles and transit. And then smart scale financing is something that has also allowed for 100% of transportation electrification projects in Virginia. And so that is a annual application for road transportation projects through VDOT and through DRPT. So take a look at smart scale uh, as a possible funding opportunity. I'm gonna talk a little bit about battery electric vehicles. Next slide. Um, we have, should have some pretty good experience with hybrid vehicles. They've been on the road in the United States since 96. And the spectrum of electric vehicles ranges from hybrid vehicles to plug-in hybrid vehicles to electric vehicles. Plug-in hybrid vehicles start on electricity. They have a battery that provides them some of their power, and then they have a backup opportunity with gasoline. And then all electric vehicles are powered entirely by electricity. They have a larger traction battery, and their full duty cycle is 
recharged. It's charged off the grid. I'm just providing a quick overview, a fuel and technology uh, neutral overview of electric vehicles. The second piece I'm just going to mention briefly is charging. And so electric vehicles have different charging rates. All the light duty vehicles come with a 110 plug in the trunk. But for heavier duty vehicles, you're going to be moving on to level two, which tops off its capability at charging at 19.2 kilowatts. And then DC fast charging, which could scale all the way up to 450 kilowatts of, of energy. It, so um, these are just different charging options. Um, on this slide, you see the level one charger, which is just a reg which could also plug into a regular household plug, the level two charger which could plug into a regular NEMA uh, 1450 outlet, like a 50 amp uh, 220 outlet. And then the DC fast chargers, which have a few different standards. The, um, the charger in your lower right is the North American standard, the SAE combo charger. So there's some great, great technologies ahead. And uh, just wanted to provide that quick overview and to remind anybody that is listening that Virginia Clean Cities would love to help you write up a project and get your project funded and completed. It might take years, but we're all here to help. I look forward to the question and answer sections. Sarah? Thank you, Alan. And so now we will move on to the greater charging spectrum. Uh, first up, we will hear from Kate Staples of Dominion Energy, and then we will hear from Rebecca Gutierrez from Blank. Uh, Kate, go ahead and take it away. Good afternoon, Sarah, can you nod if you can hear me? Perfect, thank you. Um, I'm Kate Staples, I'm the manager of electrification at Dominion Energy. I'm excited to be here with you guys today. Um, Alan gave a great overview of some of the um, funding opportunities and, and charging technologies that are out there. And the other speakers are gonna talk about um, some of the equipment and some of the solutions for um, fleets and, and transit and heavy duty vehicles. Um, I wanted to talk about ways that you can partner with your utility when you're um, thinking about charging infrastructure for your fleets um, or your workplaces or your heavy duty vehicles. Um, so we start with um, communication. Um, unlike a data center or a big factory, um, bus depots or delivery truck sites um, or, or transit agencies may have little interaction with their utility. Um, you know, they're not super high intensity electric users. They, you pay their bills or call a hotline if their lights go out, which doesn't happen very often. So they rarely think about their utility. So as they're electrifying their fleets, in a matter of months, they can go from being a customer that's had relatively small um, interaction with their utility and, a, and be a relatively small electricity user to having a really significant electrical load. And we know that that transition is difficult and we wanna help you make that transition. Um, so the first thing we wanna do is communicate. Um, in talking with our customers, we know that electrifying a fleet and modifying your facility for that fleet can take time. We know you need to plan. Um, we know you need to do um, upgrades and order equipment. Um, and if you need utility upgrades, that may, time, may, <clears throat> that may take time too. So if you include us in your early planning discussions, we can work together so that when your vehicles arrive, your charging infrastructure is installed and it's tested and operational. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I have nightmares of vehicles getting delivered and the charging infrastructure not being there and available. Um, so we, we fortunately haven't run into that with any of the partnerships we've done so far, which is great. Um, and we wanna keep it that way. Um, so communicate with us early and often so that we can coordinate on timelines. Um, the second thing is, um, ask us for help. Uh, we work with a lot of customers. I talk to peer utilities every single day, um, and we at Dominion Energy are electrifying our fleet, our light duty um, and our medium duty fleet. So we have some lessons learned that we can share, um, or at least some more stories. And if you're experiencing challenges, let us know about them. Um, if you need an estimate for utility upgrades, we can provide that for you. If you need a letter of support for some of the funding opportunities that Alan mentioned, we can send you one. Um, we want to help you make this a success. Um, so that's my third icon up here, partnership opportunities. Um, we want to partner with our customers that are electrifying um, their fleets to make it a long-term success. 
Um, we know that the transition takes time and we wanna be there with you every step of the way. Um, and one of the ways that we're doing that is through our smart infrastructure pilot program. Um, that's the box on the screen. Um, and so your takeaway from this is it's rebates, it's money. Um, if you're installing a networked charging station, um, we have rebates up to about $53,000. Um, you can do it for one charger or up to six. Um, and we also have rebates for the utility and site construction. Um, so we encourage you to go to our website. It's dominionenergy.com slash skip. Skip stands for smart charging infrastructure pilot, but I like to think of it as skip the gas station, skip the emissions. Um, so dominionenergy.com slash skip. And there's all the information about this rebate program. There's also a way that you can contact us if you have questions. You can contact your key account manager, you can contact me or the email address on that website and we'll talk you through all the details of the program. Um, so that's what I wanted to mention today um, and I'll be here if folks have questions throughout the webinar. Thank you. Kate, okay, and now we will hear more about charging from Rebecca Gutierrez at Flink. Take it away, Rebecca. Sure, thanks, Sarah. Um, so it's fantastic to follow on um, when someone's giving money and incentives for electric vehicles and electrifying fleets. So thank you. I love that. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. I think we all pretty much know the chatter is out there. Um, EVs are not really the future anymore. They're here. We've turned the precipice. Um, although this slide indicates the expected um, adoption for light vehicles, um, it's very much the same story with fleets. Um, I'm sure you've all heard recently Biden's commitment to have the U.S. government uh, fleet go electric at a tune of $2 trillion. Uh, so we're very much all in at this point um, from the traditional manufacturers, Ford, Volvo, Daimler, um, up to some new players in the electrification of heavy duty and fleet vehicles, Nikola. Um, Rivian Tesla is also making a semi. So the demand is very much there. Um, Sarah, if you can go ahead and flip through, it'll show you just how much we have to do on the infrastructure side, which is why it was so great to follow Kathleen. Um, the infrastructure has not caught up to the demand, um, and certainly that's going to continue. So what we do at Blink is actually try to bridge that gap. Um, we work with the states that have rebates and the energy companies, utilities um, that are offering things, and then work with the uh, consumers, the fleet providers, and the EV um, destination locations who actually want to provide the infrastructure. So what we have is both DCFC and level two um, charging infrastructure opportunities. So we did talk, or Ellen did uh, give you a little introduction about level one charging is really meant to be single family home, very slow, you know, plug it into a wall out and come back a couple of days. Um, not really very practical, certainly for anything we're talking about today. So that gives you the options of the level two uh, and the DCFC charging, at least for the short term. I know we're gonna talk a little bit about wireless and some other capabilities coming up. Uh, but for Blink, what that really is looking at is on the left side there, the IQ200, that's our level two charger, uh, dual port, you can have different configurations, pedestal, wall mount, you name it. Um, we're seeing a lot of interest in this product specifically for um, like school bus fleets because it's very cost, uh, it's very cost effective to install it. One of the configurations we have, you can connect 20 units to one smart unit to control them all. Um, it also provides local load sharing. So if you don't have a lot of wire um, electrical capacity, they can share the load as well. So that's a very popular one when you can charge, um, say like for a school bus, you can go do your runs, come midday, charge it, and then go out, do another run after school and then charge it all overnight. So you really, that's like your two cycle charging. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, we have the DCFC product. So that's where you're gonna get your fast charging. Uh, we have products ranging from 50 to 175 kilowatts. So depending on the electrical wiring you install, of course, um, the speed of the charging as well. So some of your delivery fleets and things like that may need a more performance charger and that would be your DCFC. I mean, I would be remiss not to mention uh, the portable charger. Uh, it's a love-hate kind of situation with this guy. Um, it is operated on a gasoline generator. 
However, it does help in those emergency situations. Say maybe somebody noticed, didn't notice the battery was running low. They went out, they started uh, deliveries or what have you. And next thing you know, they're on a battery. This really is kind of the security blanket for your fleet where you can deliver enough charge to get them back to base and get them charged up along the way. Uh, blank is, uh, sorry, you can go ahead and and go to the last slide. So, you know, we're not new at this. We've been in the industry for over 12 years. Um, we're really at a point now where things are just exploding faster than you can imagine, which is just fantastic. Um, we've used as a case study really California because they were leading uh, in, Cal in um, electric vehicle uh, infrastructure from the get go. Hopefully, Virginia is going to do it with this great uh, um, grant rebate from Dominion and some of the grant opportunities with Virginia Clean Cities. Um, but, you know, we see these used for school buses, for delivery trucks, things of that nature. And it's just truly fantastic um, to be able to put the infrastructure in place to accelerate the fleet adoption. Uh, I believe that's it for me, but thank you very much. Quick time. Um, we are right on schedule, um, so thank you very much. Um, and now we will move on to learning about heavy duty electric vehicles. First up, we will hear from Ryan Zip from Roush Clean Tech, and then he will be followed by Albert Early from the Bluebird Corporation. Uh, Ryan, go ahead and take it away. Hi everyone, I'm Ryan Zick from Roush Clean Tech, and I'm very happy to be here today to talk a little bit about our battery electric truck. Uh, that's in the class six space. So if you would advance to that first slide. Um, Roush Clean Tech uh, has a, a pretty long history now in alternative fuel. So we we got into alternative fuels really 13 years ago. And we're most prominently known for our propane auto gas offering. So we've offered those with uh, Bluebird school buses exclusively all the way across the Ford medium duty platforms. And We've been fortunate enough to put tens of thousands of alternative fuel vehicles out there on the road. And that experience with medium duty fleets has really led us to where we are now with um, offering a battery electric product for that same space based on some of the feedback and the users that we've really uh, spent a lot of time getting to know their operations and, and what they do with vehicles. And we thought we had a really great fit uh, for a medium duty truck. So if you would advance to the next slide. So we started with in our first offering uh, that we are in production with, and we have models running now in California, uh, is an F650 based battery electric truck. So uh, it's it's a chassis offering with a multitude of bodies that could be configured for it, just like a traditional fueled F650 would be. But this one, of course, having no internal combustion engine whatsoever, just being straight battery. Our focus for the vehicle is really uh, it's really been formed up by a lot of our experience with these medium duty fleets. So. The class six truck really fits nicely in this area where uh, you don't necessarily have to have a CDL requirement to drive it. We also wanna focus on areas of last mile delivery as this is a large growing segment of the uh, delivery business. As you can imagine um, in the past 18 months, how much uh, two door uh, drop offs have gone up through companies like Amazon and others that have really picked up that last mile delivery. The other big focus there being that these vehicles being in last mile spend a lot of time in neighborhoods where uh, noise pollution along with tailpipe emissions is a much bigger focus. So the battery electric truck fits really well in that space. A lot of these routes are also around a hub and spoke design. So that's really important, you know, segueing off the last segment of infrastructure that investments in infrastructure can be taken fully advantage of because these vehicles are returning back to that same base to uh, fill back up with cargo parcels, all that good stuff. And at that time could take advantage of the charging infrastructure. We're also looking primarily at dry del delivery or lighter weight cargo. Uh, the main focus behind that is obviously offsetting some of the weight that we have in consideration for the battery packs. And then also municipalities based on uh, their needs in that application as well. And if you would advance to the next slide. So just real high level basics of our Gen 1 battery electric truck. So it does utilize level one as we talked about charging of course, but also level two. So you can get around uh, full charge from zero in about 68 hours. Uh, it has 335 horsepower, but like most battery electric vehicles, tons and tons of torque. So 1800 uh, foot pounds of torque. So plenty for a class six, 26,000 pound vehicle. Uh, full battery electric, as I mentioned, no internal combustion engine. Uh, at max GVW, our estimated range is around 100 miles. 
And then that payload, so once you take off what the chassis and all of that weight is, it's about 14,500 pounds of maximum payload. So a really great fit for class six. You can advance, thank you. Uh, giving you a little bit better view of what the uh, truck looks like there. You can kind of see the X-ray looking at the uh, behind the scenes of what comprises all the truck there. And we've got a better view too, but the chassis in general, so F650 only, as I said, 26,000 pound uh, chassis with 14,500 available payload, around 100 miles with a top speed of 65 miles per hour. The battery capacity is 138 kilowatt hour. You can see our great ability stats there. And as I mentioned, charging of about six to eight hours on level two at about 60 amps or uh, 20 kilowatt. Uh, warranty standard for the vehicle is five years, 60,000 miles. And if you want to advance to the next slide, I'll give you a better look at what the, uh, the truck looks like and the uh, different components on it. So, as you can see, we really focused uh, pretty heavily on trying to keep all of the electric components in the traditional fuel drivetrain and fuel, uh, fuel package space of the vehicle. So, what I mean by that is battery packs that are between the frame rail. That's where typically a transmission would be in a drive line. Uh, the reason why that's so important is because the people who use these chassis already have a body uh, builder or body type in mind, whether it be a box truck or delivery uh, body or that type of thing. So if we keep the electrical components in those same package areas, we're not going to limit users from being able to you know, get the accommodated body that they're used to operating in their fleet today. So the whole focus of that is you know, being able to go to an alternative fuel without having to sacrifice what you do today and really fit that vehicle right into the existing uh, landscape that you operate in. So uh, with that, I think that pretty much covers my piece, but thank you for the opportunity to talk about our battery electric product today. Thank you so much, Ryan. And now we will hear about electric school buses from Albert Burley. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm Albert Burley. I'm the regional executive director from Bluebird. Um, we are a bus manufacturer, been around since 1927. Uh, we do a lot of alternative powered buses. That's kind of our thing. We consider ourselves the expert. We build buses uh, in propane and gas with the route system that Ryan just mentioned. Uh, we also do compressed natural gas. Uh, actually, about um, half of what we do at our Fort Valley, Georgia factory is something other than a diesel product. And our, our latest alternative powered product is the electric school bus. And we'll talk a little bit about that. If you could go to the next slide. So we've been doing this for a little while. Um, we actually were the first OEM to introduce a electric powered school bus back in 1994. Um, yeah, 25 years ago, we introduced our first electric school bus. It was all electric. Um, we uh, only built it for a few years. Uh, we had the buses go into service in school districts. We also used some buses as shuttle buses during the 1996 Atlanta Summer Olympics. Um, so, like I mentioned, it was a three year um, stint. Uh, the technology certainly isn't what it is today. So, some, you know, not uh, the same performance or range that you'd expect today. Uh, but we did learn a lot during those three years about electrification of school buses. Uh, next slide. Um, so, kind of where are we today and how do we get back into electric school buses? In 2016, we were awarded a 4.9 million grant from the U.S. Department of Energy for development and commercialization of a high powered Buttigieg school bus. Uh, we launched that product the next year in Reno, Nevada. At, at a trade show. And then in 2018, at the end of the year, we delivered our first electric power school buses to customers in California. Now, jumping to today in 2021, currently we're the only school bus manufacturer to have produced and deployed electric school buses in all vehicle types, type A, type C, and type D. Uh, we're the only one to offer a standard CCS1 connector. So you can do either AC level two or DC fast charging on our bus. You don't have to make a decision when you order the product. It will do either depending on what infrastructure you have set up um, at, uh, at the school district. Uh, v to G capability is standard in all our EV buses. We believe that's important as schools try to uh, offset some of those upfront costs with some additional revenue through uh, V to G capability. And uh, today we have over 400 electric school buses introduced into 15 states and those are about Oh, about 130 different customers have purchased our product to date. Uh, next slide. 
So uh, we offer a uh, type C and type D. We also mentioned we offer type A uh, through our sister company, Microbird. But in big buses, we offer uh, a type D and type D, I'm sorry, type C and type D. Uh, they both have a 155 kilowatt hour battery. Our range is up to about 120 uh, miles. Uh, we offer different body sizes and capacities. Uh, we can do up to 72 passenger in the type C product and 84 passengers in the type D. Um, the range uh, certainly is impacted by things like terrain, driver habits, and the use of heating and air conditioning. So I would like to mention that as well. Uh, next slide. So uh, where have we deployed these buses? Well, you can see from the blue states um, on this map, we sold electric buses in 15 different states, uh, some that are very warm climates like Texas and Arizona, to very cold climates like New York, Minnesota, and North Dakota. Um, and so they're operating in a lot of different uh, ranges of climates and terrains. Uh, to the right of this on this chart, you can see the rapid growth in EV sales in 2018. As I mentioned, we delivered our first buses. We delivered eight buses that year. Uh, in 2019, we delivered 58 buses. In 2020, we uh, delivered about 200 buses. And this year, We've already surpassed 100 buses thus far, and we do expect that number to double or potentially triple before the end of the year. Uh, so that's uh, just a quick overview of our uh, our products. Um, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Albert, um, and now we are going to take a quick moment to answer a couple of the Q&A questions that we've received so far. Um, just a note, uh, after we do a couple of questions, we will move on to the vehicle grid, vehicle to grid portion of the webinar, and then we will be holding the rest of the questions at the end. So please stick around and continue to submit any questions that you have. Um, so the first question I have is um, oriented towards Alan. Um, the question is, is the deadline for FTA funding still April 12th? Um, that is a great question. Um, whoever is interested in the um, FTA low and no emission grant program, um, you can get direct assistance from either Virginia Clean Cities or some of our partners that we work with, CalStart, VEIC, to you know rush in an application. Um, and the uh, I have not. Tr sometimes they extend the deadlines, especially in the event of weather events or administrative trans uh, transitions. So. Um, I can't answer that right now, but we will post the low no program onto the website um, when we post the um, an article about this about this event. Thanks very much. Um, the next question is also oriented at Alan, but if anyone has any feedback, they can also uh, uh, put in their two cents. Um, so the General Assembly recently passed the Clean Air, Air Standards, sponsored by Delegate Faggy, House Bill 1965. Can you talk about how that will influence? The EV market in Virginia. Yeah, so Virginia it will likely be a carb, you know, is, is has a plan to be a carb state, and that would go into effect in 2025 model year. So within about five years, uh, automakers will be essentially um, required to sell electric vehicles in Virginia. This is really good news because Virginians traditionally have to travel to Maryland to purchase electric vehicles. Um, it also may be, allow us to follow some of the heavy duty. Um, work that is underway in California and other states. They have a plan that by 2045, they'll be selling almost entirely electric uh, or zero emissions on the heavier duty end. Um, uh, the Section 177 of the Clean Air Act allows states to optionally sign on to uh, improved air quality rules, and Virginia and about a dozen other states have signed on to those rules. So I think it is good things for air quality and for opportunity for these vehicles to be sold. Thank you. Um, so we're, we'll take two more questions right now and then the rest of them at the end when we have a longer session. Um, this first question is, I believe, oriented out the Roush Clean Tech team. Um, it is, are there any plans to add DCFC level three capabilities or capacities? Sorry. So from the uh, 
from the Roush Cleantech truck platform, we are uh, looking at DC fast charge for what we're going to call our Gen 2 product. So everything I presented on today was our Generation 1 product. And uh, we are currently in process of bringing to market Gen 2, which DC fast charge would be a standard offering along with level 2. And then um, sort of on that same vein, uh, at Cleantech, do you guys have any plans to take back batteries for recycling? And if not, what do you tell customers who ask about their lifespan and afterlife? Uh, today we don't, um, and we've, I guess, historically with our other alternative fuels, I guess we've stayed out of the, the space that others are, are experts at. So, you know, on our propane side, the uh, uh, ASME standards and all that stuff, refabrication, that type of thing. So I wouldn't rule it out, but uh, we don't have plans right now to be in that space. Uh, with batteries, just like any, any battery electric vehicle, you know, you look at the, the lifespan and the complete cycles, right? So what it took from <clears throat> how many charges from complete depletion to all the way fully recharged. So, you know, we're targeting a battery pack to stay in the lane of the current life cycle of the truck. So that would be in the order of thousands and thousands of life cycles from zero to fully charged to get you to that 12 to 15 year lifespan that that truck is going to be expected to live in. Thank you very much. All right. So we will move on to learning about vehicle to grid technology now. And as I said, we will have another Q&A at the very end. So please continue to submit your questions. Um, so here to speak to us about vehicle to grid technology today, we have Dick Johnson of Newby and Dr. Willett Plimpton from the University of Delaware, uh, a professor and a, the inventor of the Appeal to Good Technology. So first up, we will hear from Dick. Go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Sarah. I appreciate being here. Um, I've been with Newby now probably 12 weeks, uh, but my background goes clear back with Dr. Kempton when he first came to my office and said, can you convert vehicles over to from gas to electric? And if I wasn't a science-oriented person, I probably would have told him to get lost. But since then, I've been involved with him from the very beginning. So this, this technology is particularly important to me. Uh, and, and moving forward, I think, to the world as, as uh, another alternative. So next slide, Sarah. So Nuvi has been around for 10 years at least, uh, and mostly in Europe to begin with. Uh, we've, come, we've come to the United States because school buses are an ideal target, and so are heavy-duty trucks uh, that are currently being sold. Our function is basically we're a software company, and I think one of the key differences that I find is people don't really understand vehicle-to-grid. It's not like you just plug your toaster in and all of a sudden it's able to communicate and, and uh, produce a revenue stream. Uh, it's taken a while to actually perfect the software and the interconnect, which I'll talk about. So Nuvi is basically selling a platform. We don't manufacture buses. We don't manufacture EVSEs. We partner with companies to try to come up with a, a solution. Um, and because vehicle to grid does produce revenue in a lot of cases, we've come up with a turnkey package that finances the whole package together. And that's really what I'm selling is the platform, which includes the bus, the EVSE, uh, some of the infrastructure and the connection to the grid and the interface with the uh, utility. So we are specialists in V2G assessment worldwide and also deployment. Next slide. So just to give you an idea of what turnkey package we offer, we have a software program that basically allows the driver to program the vehicles and also the fleet managers so that actually they're at full capacity when the bus, in this case, needs to go out uh, on a run. And so that's critical so that you know the level of state of charge that each of the bus is at. The other thing that we put together is basically on a DC fast charger, it has to be bi-directional, uh, which means it has to be able to go both directions. And it also has an interface with the internet so that it has an internet connection that goes up to our cloud. So the whole idea, no matter where you're at, it, you, don't, you can be in the whole state of Virginia and connect uh, through the aggregation platform and the software that we have. I think that's the big difference here 
and pulling the whole idea of vehicle to grid together is to have that aggregation software so that in some place like PJM or Dominion, it shows up as a sole source of power. So what the aggregation software does is pull it together and then we perform the interconnect with the utility and there's, you know, we can do a variety of different functions with the utility to earn um, some revenue. So what we've gone to school districts about and, and also uh, fleet managers is basically we will finance the, the vehicle, the EVSC, up to $20,000 on the uh, infrastructure improvements and for a 10 year period of time. And that would also include full maintenance on the vehicle and full maintenance on the EVSC. So our turnkey solution allows the person to just drive the bus and lower the cost of acquisition down to the price of what a diesel would cost. So that's really what we're doing right now is basically approaching a lot of school districts. So if you have a grant, like we saw, we can still finance the other part, the, I think 45% is what's financed. We could do the other 55% uh, as a financial package. So that's what Nuvi's up to. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kempton. Dick and now we will hear from Dr. Thanks very much, uh, Sarah. My uh, tell me, my my audio is coming through okay. Yes. So uh, that was a nice start up, Dick, and I appreciate that you didn't uh, kick me out of your office when I first came by there. Uh, in the the background today, just for fun, uh, I've got uh, one of our vehicles being uh, converted for V to G in uh, Dick Johnson's. Uh, shop where he worked uh, previously. So uh, that's a little bit of history there. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, I wanna uh, talk about B2G, what that is, and uh, give a little bit more background on that. Uh, and uh, and then uh, also talk about a, a coming charging standard, maybe available in a couple of years, but if you're building things, you might consider it something to, to include uh, in an EVSC or a, a vehicle heavy vehicle. Um, so just to kind of give you a sense of what we do at the University of Delaware, we do uh, vehicle engineering, design, implementation. We implement prototypes and then see if uh, an OEM, an auto, a, a truck or automobile manufacturer wants to adopt them. Uh, we also have developed a charging station, uh, which is being sold by Nuvi. Um, we also work on standards for EV charging, uh, very important. Um, uh, so we're on committees. We've also initiated several uh, committees, uh, both in, in the US and, and in Europe. Um, <clears throat> and we work at the policy level. So there's uh, right now uh, three people in my shop working on policy. Nuvi also has a, a couple of people working on policy. Uh, and uh, that's for interconnection and market participation. That's what the policy part is so that you can, as Dick was saying, in more and more jurisdictions, you can actually earn a substantial amount of, of money. And sometimes that means uh, tariffs or taxes or other things uh, change, uh, need to be changed to uh, optimize that. <clears throat> so we're also working at the uh, uh, the uh, state law or, or tariffs, utility tariffs or that. Um, so, you know, what are we trying to accomplish in these? Uh, we're trying to prove out cost-effective engineering. Uh, we wanna make market entry cost-effective. We don't wanna do a $10,000 grid study to connect one school bus. You know, we wanna have that done in a way that's a fast track application. Utility needs to check their distribution lines, but it doesn't necessarily need to be a two-year study. Um, uh, we want to have standards that are appropriate for V to G. There's lots of standards for solar, for backfeeding from your bus depot, if you've got solar on the roof or from your home. Um, but those don't quite fit uh, with uh, V to G projects. So we're working a bit on, uh, on uh, standards and rules. Um, and then uh, we want to work with partners. So we get realistic feedback for what we're doing. And then in some cases to see commercial deployment and I think Newbie's a great success story uh, of that as Dick outlined. Next, next slide, please. 
So just to give you a sense of the team, I'm going to be talking about what we do. This is sort of the we, you know, so uh, on the right there is uh, Nuvi, some Nuvi uh, staff and also my, my crew. Uh, on the left, uh, my, my electrical engineers need a person standing up in front of a legislative body and uh, uh, pitching a, uh, a bill uh, to complete the group because we do have uh, policy people there, but you don't see them in action here. But just to give you a sense. Uh, I'll talk about it, but it's not just me doing this. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, so, what are the key aspects of the vehicle to grid concept? And I'll also refer to that as grid integrated vehicles, GIV. Um, electric vehicles, whether it's a school bus or a car or a truck, um, it's got a big battery and it's got conversion equipment to move between the DC battery and the AC grid. Those are already there. And light vehicles are parked 95% of the time on average. 95% of the time, it's not going to be used for the purpose it was manufactured for. Uh, heavy vehicles, you know, it's not uncommon to have them parked 16 hours a day. And these vehicles are typically near a plug and maybe already plugged in when they're parked and not in use. So we want to have a second use for this really valuable large battery and conversion equipment. That's Part of the idea, you're not buying it. You're going to need more renewables. You're going to need more storage for the grid. Why would should we buy all those batteries? They're going to be out there in the lot. They're going to be in the garage and so forth. So <clears throat> to provide grid services, we may need to make some changes to key components, but they are minor changes. You want to change the charger from unidirectional to bidirectional, so it can charge and discharge. And you need to add controls and signaling and software so that it can respond to grid needs. That's what Dick was talking about with Nuvi as a software company. They've done all of this. Uh, controls, it's a little bit of hardware, maybe on the vehicle, maybe in the charging station, maybe both, um, and some kind of signaling so it can respond to the grid. Because it doesn't do the utility or the grid operator any good to just punch a button when you feel like it and discharge. You have to be providing power when the grid needs a bit more power and also absorbing power when there's too much on the grid, which this happens all the time. Um, so you also need to do aggregation. Uh, uh, Dick mentioned this also. You can do you can be providing the service in different locations, say within Virginia in his example. Um, but the other reason for aggregation is you can meet all trip needs of any one individual, school bus, car, whatever. But you can also meet the aggregate need for balancing or reserves by the transmission system operator. You can meet the needs on a distribution feeder for the uh, for the uh, local distribution company, Dominion or whoever, um, because you have a group. You know, it doesn't matter that the one car or one school bus left when you weren't expecting because you're aggregating a good many. All the others just provide a little bit more or absorb a little bit more. So the concept here is that electric vehicles become part of the solution for CO2, uh, you know, oil uh, independence and so forth rather than becoming a big problem because they have emissions and so forth. Next slide. <clears throat> That's a basic concept there. <clears throat> so how does it work? Um, you're driving a vehicle. The vehicle's got a battery in it. Maybe you took a long drive. The battery's almost empty. You come uh, to your lot or your home or whatever. You plug in. The battery's low. Next slide. <clears throat> what it does immediately is charge up the battery. Not necessarily all the way. We may want to go to an intermediate level. Um, so you don't start doing services right away. You don't start doing services until the battery reaches a level that the user may specify or the smart software may figure out. Usually they need to have at least 50 miles on this vehicle or whatever. So <clears throat> it goes up at least part way. Next slide. <clears throat> now from this point, you can start providing grid services to the grid seen on the left here, or maybe uh, to the building uh, that you've got a meter on. So uh, maybe it's a and maybe it's a school building with a lot behind, and maybe it's a peak time of day, and so you're going to discharge the vehicles for a couple of hours. They're not going to have to travel for a while. Let's say the system knows I've got a peak. I don't want to have this high charge for electricity in my building. I'm going to discharge now, or maybe I'll discharge several vehicles, but others may drive soon, so I won't discharge them. So that can either be on the grid side or the building side. Next slide. Uh, then you're ready to drive. 
Maybe it's a longer trip than usual. Maybe the system says, hey, stop doing grid services. I want to just charge you now for the next hour or two. But at the time the, the vehicle needs to be ready to drive, the system will ensure there's enough charge for that. And as those of you who drive electric vehicles know, rarely do you need the battery to be full at the time that you take off. Sometimes you knew for a trip or whatever, but most of the time, something like shown in this graphic where the battery is two thirds full is plenty. And those of you who've studied battery wear know this system actually causes less wear on the battery because you're not filling it up all the time. Every time you plug it in, you're not filling it all the way up. Okay, next slide, thank you. <clears throat> so just to summarize, you know, you plug in, maybe you're nearly empty from a trip. First, it charges. Th step three, you can do grid services for a while. Uh, step four, you're ready to drive maybe already, or maybe it takes you off the grid services for a while just to charge at the end. So that's the overall concept of V to G. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, so just to kind of, I'm not going to go through all of this, but there's three types of services behind the meter. I've described that as reducing your peak charge and other things. Distribution utility is the middle one there, and the regional transmission operator, in the case of Virginia, that's PJM. Uh, so uh, they have different values, and you want to pick uh, what what your vehicle's capable of and what you want to do, you know, as a customer, the fleet manager, um, and then what's the potential revenue. So just if you could do two more clicks there, we'll get two more arrows. I'm not going to go into all the details here, but this is the kind of thing. A fleet manager probably doesn't want to figure all this out. This is part of what Newbie does, uh, which Dick described the package. But behind the behind the scenes, behind the computers, there are people who are figuring out what's the best market. How can they make uh, money by doing this in a way to never compromise the driving function of the vehicle, which is always first priority, um, and yet maximize the revenue. So next slide. <clears throat> uh, just to give a sense. Uh, some of the uh, operations here, these are uh, new uh, Nuvi operations, say on the middle top, you know, that's a Denmark, uh, uh, Denmark, uh, uh, Energinet DK is the grid operator there. Uh, those vehicles earn about 1,600 euro per year, just at 10 kilowatts plugged in when they're not being in use. That's actually a utility fleet, uh, water and uh, gas uh, utility. Um, and uh, they have a full day of use uh, eight hours and then 16 hours uh, off off duty and weekends uh you don't have to be available all the time to make money at 1600 euros is about 1800 dollars per year per vehicle so uh you know depending on the business the, the deal with nuvi maybe the fleet operator keeps part of that or maybe that's used to pay for the charging stations maintenance and so forth like the package it described but it's it's a significant amount of revenue um uh, the uh, the le upper left is uh, cars. In fact, that's one, the one that I think Dick uh, uh, retrofitted actually for the University of Delaware. Um, and in PJM, uh, which of course is also where Virginia is, uh, we can earn 1,200 per EV per year for about a 16 kilowatt um, a charging system. Uh, these are all bi-directional. Um, and, uh, and then on the right, we're testing three-phase charging standards. I'll talk about that a little bit more. That's at the uh, National Renewable Energy Lab in Golden. And the bottom, it's a uh, commercial uh, UK fleet. Uh, this is in London. Uh, and you get a sense, these are DC chargers. I believe they're about 10 kilowatts or 20 maybe. Um, and you can get a sense of what a fleet garage looks like uh, for V to G. It's, it's really not that different from an electric fleet garage uh, anyway. So uh, these are just some examples. There, there are many more. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, so we want to improve the economics, and, and we're an R&D operation. So the things that we've done, Nuvi's improved, and now our commercial products. So what's the next step for us, you know, uh, to, uh, do, to go further with V to G? So we want to earn higher revenue, which is bidirectional. And uh, there's some other things, too. I'm not going to get into the technology. The, technical details, but we want to earn higher revenue. Um, that also means more market access. I guess that's a lattermost one here. We want higher power per car also because that gives us higher revenue. So I mentioned 10 and 20, uh, 16 kilowatts. Um, you know, those the buses the Dick described are 50 kilowatts. It's more or less linear in terms of revenue. So if you've got a 10 kilowatt car versus a 50 kilowatt bus, that bus all other things being equal, is earning five times as much 
uh, from B to G. Uh, so, you know, there's an all other things being equal ash issue, but higher power is more revenue. And of course, we all know from, you know, specking electric vehicles, higher power also means a faster charge. Uh, so that's one reason we see DC chargers. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the other thing we'd like to do, and this is an active area of research right now, is have an onboard charger, which is referred to as an AC charger. But what that really means is you move the AC to DC conversion from the big box on the curb into the vehicle. Um, so <clears throat> that lowers the capital cost. Uh, so that's a, a little more involved because uh, it you know, might be half the cost. Um, so that's worth doing, uh, but it's a little more involved. Uh, it means changes on the vehicle. Uh, it means a little bit different charger, maybe a bigger charger. Um, and uh, so we need regulations to demonstrate that that's going to be possible in many, many jurisdictions. Right now, it's possible in some jurisdictions, and it's an impediment in others. Whereas DC charging, more or less, you just use the UL standard that was designed for solar inverters, and, and you're uh, you're able to start uh, doing V to G. Uh, so we need a, an alternative safety standard for AC V to G, both to give us interconnection and market access. So that's part of the standards work that we're doing at the University of Delaware. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so current and upcoming technologies, uh, I sort of said this before, so I'll be quick. Uh, now, basically you use a DC charging station aggregator like Nuvi and a UL interconnection to get on the grids uh, and have that approved by your local utility. Uh, and Nuvi provides this as a package, as Dick said. You know, you can buy this today. Um, and Bluebird, of course, uh, a, a great uh, early pioneer here has buses ready to go with uh, B to G uh, using DC. Uh, so that's available now. Um, and we're seeing more and more vendors uh, for heavy vehicles uh, with DC B to G. Um, these parts have to match, you know, so you, you want to make sure that the bus manufacturer or the truck manufacturer is talking to the aggregator. Uh, Nuvi is the one that's most uh, able to do this right now. Um, uh, and, and the charging station vendor. So you, you need to make sure those three pieces are linked up. You can't just sort of go out and say, hey, that V to G bus looks nice and that V to G charging station looks nice and I'll get this aggregator over here. They've got to actually have synchronized and make sure they work together. Some standards are available for that. Standards are not really complete yet. So that's why you actually need to have uh, coordinated companies there. <clears throat> So what we're trying to do, as I said, trying to develop AC charging as well as an, as an alternative uh, with V to G. And we're doing that through the standard called SAE for Society for Automotive Engineers, J3068. That's a, a standard for high power AC charging and V to G, which builds on an existing SAE J3072 standard for AC safety interconnection. Um, so that's an alternative to UL. Uh, for, which incorporates an IEEE standard for those of you st standards geeks in the audience. Um, so it's you know, very well known to utilities, uh, but you just, you know, you just have to walk through it with them so they understand why that's actually safer than using a UL standard for an AC charging system. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. So this 3068 standard, it exists for charging. There's a version two now to add B to G capabilities, which also provide AC and DC. I'm going to emphasize the AC because there's not really a way to do this now. And it, uh, it's kind of, we all, I think we're all going to have to revise the sort of introductory slides like Alan gave, which is the way people talk about it. There's level one, level two, and DC fast. Well, there's going to be an AC fast. So we're going to have to decide, do we want to say there's level one, level two, and AC fast and DC fast, and they're both about the same speed, but you know, AC versus DC, or do we want to just start saying there's level one, level two, and level three, and level three can be either DC or AC, because once this is fully standardized, we've got a couple of uh, vehicle manufacturers with products, AC charging will be in the 100 kilowatt range. You, with this kind of setup, you've got a much lower cost for the charging station, a little bit higher cost on the vehicle, um, but overall net, as I say, is about half the cost probably. Uh, and it can go up to 100 kilowatts uh, pretty safely. We need a little bit different connector and plug manufactured, but it's all within the existing standards and, and the agreements. To do a 200 or 300 kilowatt with this probably is not going to work. So there's still a role for DC. It's better known. There's more products today. 
you know, there isn't any AC uh, uh, 3068 plug or, or, or vehicle that's really in commercial production. Actually, you can get an EVSC from Huvi that does this, but there's not a, a vehicle. Um, so, you know, it's not something you can get right away, but I think we're probably talking in the two to three year uh, time frame here, um, <clears throat> depending on, on what the uh, heavy duty uh, manufacturers want to do. Um, that's what the plug looks like. And if, if uh, those of you looked at the European standards, uh, Europeans would call that a type two connector. So we're not trying to create a new connector, which is a huge, huge barrier to anything. Use an existing connector, the same suppliers provide it. They're like, hey, yeah, we haven't had any orders from the US from this. We've been selling them all in Europe. Okay, fine. <laughs> Just use a different shipping address. You know? So it's already there, it's tested, there's standards for it. Uh, and it is three phase, which allows you to put a lot more power uh, through it. So next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, so just to take, you know, there is actually an existing uh, EVSC that does this. It, it's about the size and shape and weight of a level two, you know, but instead of having a 19 or 20 kilowatt, which is nice, you can do 50 uh, and, you know, in the near future, 100 kilowatts through uh, this kind of a, a unit, which is, uh, you know, I mean, you can easily sell these for four or $5,000. So, so that's pretty good for a 50 uh, kilowatt uh, charging station. Uh, again, you need some changes on the vehicle. Um, so this is your sort of level three uh, AC charging. And uh, uh, if you uh, hear about this more in the future, you can remember you, you heard about it first here uh, at Virginia Clean Cities. Uh, so this is the specs and stuff. And like I said, it's actually uh, uh, available. Um, <clears throat> Right now, you can get a 50 kilowatt. Uh, we expect to be able to have 100, 100 kilowatt. Technically, it's 99 <laughs> kilowatts. I round to 100. Um, okay, I think that's it. What's the next slide? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so, thanks very much. Oh well, we these are the different standards. Unless there's a question, I won't uh, go through this slide. Um, I'll just turn end at this point. Thanks, Sarah. Right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kempton. Um, and now we will take the questions that we've been having. Are also, please feel free to continue to submit questions. Um, we have a good 30 minute chunk and we have a lot of questions that have been submitted. Um, so I will just pick them up in the order that we received them. Um, so the first question is most of these scenarios involve return to base applications. What are your thoughts on the opportunities for charging long haul? Um, this was submitted around the Roush, Cleantech, and Bluebird uh, questions. So I will open that up to whoever has answers. So I think Can from the Roush thing. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sure. Um, just from the charging infrastructure side of things, um, the various states and entities um, connecting them are actually looking at electrifying main corridors across the United States. And a lot of that electrification is with DCFC charging for those long haul routes. Um, currently there's Michigan to Montana is um, being, un it's under grant to be electrified. I'm here in Florida, the Florida Turnpike just did something as well. So you're seeing an awful lot of um, assistance and grant opportunities to electrify those corridors just for that reason. So that long haulers can get in, get their charge quickly and then be on their way. From the vehicle side, um, speaking to our medium duty product, uh, we wouldn't be there today with the product that we're offering, but as we expand and look at different platforms, um, more capacity to put on additional uh, kilowatt hours, we potentially could get to a point where we could expand from just that, as I mentioned, hub and spoke is our main focus now, but as we look at future generations of products, that's gonna absolutely be um, something that we're going to take a look at. But today, I guess, for, for what we're talking about, what's available today, it is focused around the hub and spoke design and return to base charging. And I would chime in, uh, while Virginia has hundreds of electric vehicle chargers, very few of them are capable of a uh, fast and uh, queuable. So like a heavy duty vehicle could be behind another heavy duty vehicle or could queue through the lot. And so as we do more infrastructure, there will be more robust stations, uh, entirely new breed of faster charging, larger capacity fueling station for the medium and heavy duty vehicles. Imagine they just take up a little more space in that in that parking lot than a sedan or a passenger vehicle. 
<laughs> um, so the next question that we got is related to retiring vehicles and batteries again. Um, is the industry ready to be capable of recovering and recycling the lithium ion from trucks being retired? Um, is there is the supply chain for lithium ion a concern? Uh, they hear that it is mainly a Chinese dominated supply at this time. I'll chime in from the local economic perspective. Virginia produces no oil, so our current supply chain is entirely imported oil, of which we burn um, thousands and thousands and thousands of barrels uh, every day. We, we turn a liquid fuel into air pollution. Lithium ion is a salt uh, that can be reused many times before the vehicle batteries go into another reuse cycle. So it's it's actually much more balanced environmentally than people may think, especially when you consider the alternative, which is to take a liquid out of the ground and process it into air pollution. So uh, that's a, a quick, quick and short of it. North Carolina has a phenomenal amount of lithium. Um, if we chose to, to, to go for it, we could, um, uh, but it, it, lithium is a resource from all over the, all over the nation. And I, I'm talking into a computer that also has a lithium battery. So, so we've been doing all sorts of lithium work uh, in the United States. You're muted, Dr. If I could just add to Alan, um, yeah, this is not just China. I mean, China has very good lithium reserves. South America, North America, as, as Alan mentioned, uh, there's a lot of lithium in different parts of the planet. It hasn't been fully extracted or explored for yet, but there's not an infinite amount. So, uh, kind of the people who think about this and worry about how much lithium is there, you know, there's enough to electrify every vehicle on the planet but not, you know, four or five or six times. So, you know, if you kind of just rough numbers, think about it, there's no problem with electrifying an entire, all of our vehicles, but we do have to recycle if we want to keep producing more generations and generations of lithium vehicles. But don't forget, the electrochemists are all very busy at work. So we may be using different things on the periodic table. For example, there's zinc air batteries. There's lots of other things that may in the long run be more valuable than, or better than lithium ion. So that's not any reason to not electrify the vehicle fleet. But right now, lithium ion's the best we've got. <clears throat> um, so this next question was directed towards Kate at Dominion. Um, so Kate, are Dominion's time of use rates better than the standard 24 seven rates for residential customers? Yes. Did you say residential? Yes, residential. Yes, we have a couple of different um, time of use rates. I'll actually put um, in the chat the link to the new one that we um, are launching this year. Um, but yes, they are more attractive than the, the standard residential rate um, to encourage folks to use um, their appliances and charge things like their electric vehicle um, during off peak times. Um, and then for Rebecca, um, is it correct? that the assumption, um, is it correct, is it a correct assumption that gasoline generators are more efficient than internal combustion engines at creating motion via electricity? Uh, I got a little tripped up there in the beginning, um, but no, <laughs> it's, I think where we're going, um, I'm trying to look, can you repeat, is it not correct that gasoline de generators are more efficient? Oh, are you on mute? Um, is it a correct assumption that gasoline generators are more efficient than internal combustion engines at creating motion via electricity? And I'm assuming that is in reference to our mobile generator, um, which is really not the same conversation. Um, the mobile generator is filling a need based on the industry and where it's been with range anxiety. It is definitely not meant to be um, in in exchange for an electric vehicle and an EV charging infrastructure, it is only there um, for, say, your roadside assistance providers and those kinds of things. Um, so it, it's kind of a moot point, um, to be honest, for what it is and what, what we're trying to do with it. You're not going to fill your vehicle with that, that with that product, and nor would we ever want you to. We want you to go electric. Um, so our next question is about Nuvi. Uh, does Nuvi software allow for scheduling the charging of school buses 
so that power can be taken from the batteries when the utility needs it, but leaves sufficient power or takes them back at the right time when the kids need to be transported? Yes, the answer is yes. So that whole program is set up so that there's always sufficient energy to pick up the kids on the route and come back. Um, so you can time it any way you want. And, you know, people that are using it now basically have, I was talking to a woman has three routes. And so she goes out an hour and a half in the morning, then plugs in and then goes out an hour and a half in the afternoon and then two and a half hours later in the day. So she set up her her route to actually have the vehicle available at, during that period of time. So then the rest of the time it's plugged in at night. So it, it's up to 100% charge by the time it gets up again. So, so yeah, the whole whole idea of the concept is to be able to have a bus that's functional and also be able to collect, uh, you know, interact with the um, utility at the times that it's not in use. I thought I clicked it, but I guess I had it. Right, thank you. Um, so now a question for Dr. Timken. How do you see the SAE J3068 and the IEC 15118-20 standards evolving and coexisting? Well, the generally, I mean, either one can be used for either AC or DC, but sort of just by convention and who's been, which companies have been doing what? I'd say 1511.8 is generally going to be used for DC charging control and 3068 is going to be used for AC charging control. Um, there's advantages to each that's probably more than we need to talk about, but, um, but uh, yeah, they're both kind of pretty rich uh, sequences of uh, com commands and communications between the vehicle and the, the charging station. Um, and they're both capable of V to G, although it's it's not really fully in 1511.8 yet. Um, I, I don't know. I, I mean, generally it's AC versus DC and uh, we'll see what happens in the future. <clears throat> um, and this next question is for Alan. Um, is there any legislative actions on the horizon to implement financial incentive programs along the lines of what we have in California? Um, examples are CORE slash HVIP or IV slash Carl Moyer or even developing an LCFS credit program. Uh, that's a really great question. I will say there's action in Virginia's legislative session every year. We vote every year and then every year we also have a legislative session. Sometimes they're short, sometimes they're long. This year, there actually was a legislative uh, action to enable a light duty electric vehicle incentive. And I say light duty just because it's it's not like $200,000, it's like, like $2,000, which is a meaningful amount, but it will not move the needle on uh, a equipment that needs a much larger incentive. So there will be future work like in California for a heavy duty incentive or like in Maryland where they have a similar the program that was just mentioned for the California version. Um, a lot of the, Virginia will be making all of the heavy duty vehicles that Volvo will be electrifying. And so um, when Volvo, which is doing its lights pilot program in California, they selected those vehicles because there was assistance from the state of California in getting those vehicles out. So they might be making them in Dublin, Virginia, but then they're, um, they're testing them out in the states that have the the incentives to clean up that piece. So um, there probably will need to be work. There'll need to be other opportunities. Right now, there isn't much action on the low carbon fuel standard for Virginia, but there is a multiple state uh, a group that's working on essentially beginning to cap the carbon on, on fuels. Um, it's a project called the Transportation Climate Initiative, TCI, and that's under review in a number of different states. Our peers in Washington, DC, just joined uh, onto that activity as well as like Connecticut and a few other states in the Northeast. Um, and so that's the quick, that's the quick piece of it. There's just a ton of federal resources. So Virginia, with the exception of this EV credit, 
we've always depended on federal resources or things like the settlement resources from diesel emissions. And so there is funding out there for pilot stage and other other work. Uh, hopefully there'll be um, balanced resources ahead. Um, and this next question is again oriented at Moody. Um, is Moody participating in the PJM energy market? If not, how will revenue be generated to offset capital costs for like school buses and chargers? Um, and then there will be a follow-up after that. I should let Willett answer that because that's the first people we went after was PJM. So uh, yes, they are participants and they do understand the technology. Maybe you want to add to yeah. that, Willett? Well, sure. Yeah. And so we the, the, there's some cars like the one you see in the background here in the shop. Uh, uh, the the uh, or the uh, sorry burgundy car that you saw, and also stationary batteries. Those are all participating in the PGM market right now through Nuvi. Uh, so. That's kind of ongoing, you know, helping keep the lights on, <laughs> uh, bidding the natural gas uh, uh, generators for the services that we provide, which is a balancing service called regulation. So, yeah, uh, uh, continuously working. The, I'm not sure exactly the, uh, the kind of status of the state laws in Virginia and how that how that's all done. You know, there's many different aspects of it. I don't know, Dick, if there's something right now participating in Virginia, but Nuvi is definitely continuously currently participating in the PJM market and, and making money doing that. Right. Yeah. We have nothing going right now, but hope to in the future. Um, and, and I could chime in. There are some things going on in Virginia, and I sort of skipped this slide, but in Danville, Virginia, we've got an electric vehicle using a vehicle to grid uh, PJM connection software um, through Fermata, which is a Virginia company. And so just look at this beautiful um, <laughs> Uh, finance vehicle from Danville, Virginia, and then also last week, Roanoke, um, which is not Roanoke, Virginia, but Roanoke, North Carolina, also online a similar Nissan Leaf based um, vehicle to grid uh, fun. And so I just wanted to share this since it was a timely clip. Uh, Fermata is a Virginia company out of Charlottesville, um, and obviously uh, working in places like Danville and places called Roanoke. We've got this stuff happening here at home. <clears throat> yeah. And um, then following up on that, uh, could you walk us through the tenure finance model with schools and what that might look like? Sure. And and it again depends on what the revenue production production would be, you know, in the area that you're in, and you saw the variety that uh, Willett showed. <clears throat> but what we so. What we look at is if you have no funding at all, we look at, you know, what the cost of the Bluebird bus would be. Our EVSE sells for roughly 55,000 for a DC or a level three charger. And then what we generally do is contribute about $20,000 for the infrastructure upgrade, but it looks like Dominion kind of jumps in on that part of it too, which is, is good. So we look at the whole package and then what we do is uh, basically come up with a financial uh, package that is on a per month basis, um, looking across the 10 year period of time. So we also look at the total cost of ownership. So we try to get down to what the cost of the diesel would be um, so that you have cost parity over that 10 year period of time. So I don't know if that really explains it, but it's, you know, recently looking at it somewhere around $2,200, but it depends on what the revenue side of the uh, PJM model is. That answer it, Sarah? It's good for me, but I don't run school buses, so. <laughs> Um, I'm hoping it does, and if it doesn't, please put any follow-up questions in. Yeah, well, I'm more than willing to talk to anybody to actually look at their particular case and, and actually run some numbers for them so they can look at it. Uh, but it's probably, if you don't have a DERA grant, or even if you do, you're probably looking at a, a cost that's a lot more than a diesel bus. For a diesel bus might be ninety to to $100,000, and we're looking at 
roughly $360,000. And when you add in all the infrastructure, it, it comes up to even in the 400,000. So it's a big one for school districts to swallow at this point. So anything that can offset that cost. Good time to pitch one more time that the state does plan on incentivizing school buses this year. So if anybody's interested, now's the time to talk with, with Dick and with your um, school bus providers just about the technology that's going to be incentivized by the Commonwealth of Virginia. Thank you, Alan. And um, we still have about 10 minutes left. Um, so I'm going to uh, throw in a question that was actually answered in the chat, but I think would be useful for everyone to hear. Um, so uh, the question was, I see a lot of difference in charging times for level two charging from 20 to even 65 miles per hour, uh, which isn't. Rebecca, this might be a good moment to mention that top spec 19.2 kilowatt hours. Yeah, absolutely. I answered it in the chat, um, but thank you, Ellen. Um, so the Blink level two charger is actually intended to be more or less future proof so that um, we, we designed to the top of the level two tier. So what you can do is install our IQ 200 product on a hundred amp circuit and you'll get an output of 19.2 kilowatts. Um, currently, there's only one model of a Tesla that can draw that um, and, and their onboard charger can receive 19.2 kilowatts. With that configuration, so you have to take into consideration the car and the output of the charger, with that, you'll get about 65 miles um, of charge an hour. Uh, cars or you know, light duty vehicles, heavy, heavy duty vehicles that charge less than that, are only going to charge to their maximum capacity. Um, but as we heard from Ryan, his can take, you know, the 19.2 kilowatts, then he's going to get all of it when he charges. Hopefully that didn't confuse anymore. <laughs> yeah, can, can, I try, can I try a simple version of that and tell me if I've got that with this right, Rebecca? You look at how many kilowatts the car can take or the bus and how many kilowatts the charging station can provide. Uh, with level two, it can be up to 19 kilowatts, uh, but each one, as Rebecca said, can be less than that. And so whichever is the less of the two, that's how much you're going to get. Absolutely. So if you have a, if you have a 19 kilowatt charging station and a car that can take 10, you're going to be getting 10. Um, so then how long does it take miles per hour? I mean, that's kind of a fun measure to use, but. Really, it's what's the size of your battery? That's in kilowatt hours. And how fast is your charge? So if you've got a 20 kilowatt hour battery and a 10 kilowatt charging, then it's going to take two hours to charge. So I'm sorry, there's electrical units, but you learn gallons for gasoline. It's kilowatts and kilowatt hours, and you multiply or divide, and you know how long it takes to charge. Uh, it's not really miles per hour, and it's not gallons, but it's a fairly yeah, simple it's calculation. As, as the industry shifts, we're all still learning the new vernacular. That's something consumers certainly um, are very familiar with. So we try to estimate it for them because we, we actually get that question all the time. So thank you for explaining that. That was fantastic. Yeah, thank you both for that. Um, so at this time, we are seeing a slowdown of questions coming in. If anyone has any uh, last things they want to ask, or if uh, any of our panelists have any last thoughts that they want to add on, this would be a great time. I want to say thank you to our moderator and thank you to everybody in the audience who, who stuck with us and stuck through your questions. This is fantastic. Thank you, Alan, for having us. Well, thank you so much, everyone. And uh, I would just like to say that uh, this has been recorded. We will be sharing it uh, shortly. And um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us at Virginia Clean Cities um, or any of the panelists. Their contact information will be provided as part of that recording um, as it was on their slide. Thanks for having us, Sarah and Ellen. Thank you. Have a great rest of your week, everyone. You too, thanks.